nanohub.org. So today, uh, we are actually starting to talk about AFM. Uh, previous few lectures were kind of an overview of scanning telling microscopy. Tried to provide some historical background about how STM evolved and developed and what it's useful for. Today we're going to make this transition from STM to AFM. Uh, the best paper to read for historical purposes is, is Binning and Rohr's, uh, or Binning, this is Binning, Quate, and Gerber, right? Their paper published in 1986 when Binning visited Stanford for a sabbatical. This was right after I think he won the Nobel Prize. And, um, I found references to the web which claim this paper has been cited over 2,000 times. And if that's true, it makes it one of the most widely cited papers in the history of science, right? Usually if you get a few hundred sites on a paper that you publish, you're, you tend to be happy, right? That means at least 200 people somewhere in the world has read it. This paper has been cited thousands of times just gives you a, an idea of the impact that this atomic force microscope has had. Um, so I have no idea when this 2,000 sites was recorded. It could be a lot more than that by now. So I don't know when that, that statistic was uh, published. Uh, the big problem with STM is that it requires a conducting substrate. Okay. You're tunneling current from a tip into a substrate, so that means both the tip and the substrate have to be conducting. They have to be conductors of electricity. And of course, as most of you know, uh, there are many materials uh, that don't conduct electricity, and the question is, is it possible to use a scanning probe approach to study those materials? Um, Surprising as it may sound, even at the first STM conference, this was back in 1986, there were people in the audience who were standing up and saying, well, STM is nice, but it only works for metals. Is there another way we can think to, to uh, study non-conductors? And at the time, that was, it struck me as being incredible because uh, speaker after speaker was getting up in 1986 showing these marvelous STM images of things that we had never seen before. Um, and yet there were people saying at the time, can we extend the technique to non-conductors? So it just gives you a, some insight into uh, how people think about these things. Um, and so the, the, uh, the, uh, the extension of scanning probe to a non-conducting substrate occurred in this 1986 paper. Uh, and what Binning had come up with while he was visiting Stanford was that instead of measuring a tunnel current between the tip and the substrate, why don't we measure the force that the front atom on a tip feels when it's gently rastered across a substrate. And so this atomic force is kind of a mythical atomic force because you imagine in your mind that this tip is, has this one front atom located on it and it's this one front atom that interacts with the atoms in the substrate, right? So that's kind of wishful, uh, well that's kind of a fanciful thought, but nonetheless, the idea was that if you could, um, if you could measure that force, then perhaps you could, uh, use this technique for non-conducting substrates. Because there will be this atomic force between the front atom of the tip and the substrate. That force will be there independent of whether the, the substrate is conducting or insulating. So that was the main idea. Now the problem was, as you, as you move that tip across the substrate, it's going to rise and fall as it follows the contour of atoms on the substrate. And the rise and fall of the tip is clearly going to be of atomic dimensions, right? So you have to imagine uh, 
if you're going to use this approach to measure, let's say, topography, right, you're going to have to imagine that you're going to have to measure this rise and fall of the tip as it's rasted across the substrate with uh, sub-angstrom resolution in principle, right? And the question is, how do you do that? And the key idea that, that Binnig uh, proposed was, he says, well, we have a very sensitive height monitor with scanning tele microscopy. Right? We made the case in prior lectures that uh, the tunnel current between the tip and the substrate varies exponentially with, with separation between the tip and the substrate. So why not use that as a height monitor to track the motion of this tip as it's rastered across a substrate, right? So that was the idea, because 1986, the ability to track sub-angstrom motion was limited solely to STM. That was the only, only technique you could uh, imagine that would have the sensitivity in the Z direction. Um, so the initial implementation of this atomic force microscope is shown in the left side of this slide. Um, if you look at the, at the, the, the cartoon, the, the thing labeled B is a tip. I think it was a diamond tip. It was glued onto a, a gold foil. So the cantilever was made out of a gold foil. And the substrate A was a so-called AFM sample, right? That sample A was scanned in a controlled way underneath that tip. And as the tip traced over the topography of the sample, they actually used a scanning tunneling microscope tip labeled C in this diagram, right? They used the tunnel current between the tip and the gold foil cantilever to monitor the gentle rise and fall of the cantilever as, it, as, as the sample was rastered underneath it, right? So uh, the first AFM topographic scans, this is on an aluminum oxide sample. Uh, there's a total of five scans that they were able to measure in a systematic way that would indicate something about the topography of the sample that, that they were investigating. Um, but that was, that was the first AFM scan, right? That was the first implementation of, of an atomic force microscope. Now, <laughs> I mean, this is a, a cartoon that shows a little bit more clearly what they were trying to achieve, okay? And um, if you know anything about scanning tele microscopy, uh, that is a difficult technique to, uh, to pull off it's in itself. And yet what they managed to do is they managed to position this gold STM tip above this gold cantilever foil and measure the tunnel current as they systematically uh, rastered this aluminum oxide substrate underneath that diamond tip. So the chances that the tip, the gold foil cantilever and the STM tip, chances that all those were working at once properly was very small, right? And th that was the uh, drawback actually of the early implementation of AFMs is that that tunnel current between the tip, the STM tip, and the conducting cantilever, that, that, that tunnel junction was really hard to maintain. Right? And of course, that was the key to allow you to monitor the gentle rise and fall of the cantilever as you try to map out the, the, the topography of the substrate. Okay? But that's how they proposed to do it. The tip is, in this case, it's actually loaded against the substrate. So this is referred to as the contact AFM mode scan. It's very similar to a profilometer, except the sensitivity of this atomic force microscope is, is, is the sensitivity is dictated by your ability to measure that tunnel current and how that, that tunnel current changes. And so if the tunnel current changes by, uh, like a factor of 10 that corresponds to a 
a rise and fall of the diamond tip by, let's say, a tenth of a nanometer. So it's really sensitive, but it's really hard to pull off. Okay. Nonetheless, they were able to achieve it, and um, people started to ask in some detail, what's going on? I mean, what is, what is the physics behind this contact measurement of the tip with the substrate? Okay. And questions were asked about what is the nature of the forces that act between the tip and the substrate, and um, what kind of spring do you need to attach to the tip in order to monitor accurately the topography of the substrate. And this, these questions, which were launched back in the 1986-1987 time frame, these are still very active and important questions under consideration today. A lot of theorists are still trying to model in detail the interaction of that tip with the substrate. They're trying to include all the relevant forces. And looking back, what we've learned in the last two decades is that there are two types of interactions between the tip and the substrate. One type of interaction is the lead atom on the tip interacts with the lead atom on the substrate, and that's the so-called atom-atom interaction. Okay, so that's what, that's the atomic force. That's really the atomic force that, that everyone would like to get at. But unfortunately, there's a group of atoms on the tip and there's a group of atoms on the substrate and those atoms on the, 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 those group of atoms on the tip interact with the group of atoms on the substrate in this t collective tip substrate interaction, which is generically known as Van der Waals forces. Okay. And we'll discuss Van der Waals forces all next week. We'll have two lectures that try to take you from, uh, very basic understanding uh, all the way up to the details of Van der Waals forces. So there's the 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 atom atom interaction is very short range, right? It's it's on the order of an atomic uh, bond, which is maybe two to three angstroms. All right? These Van der Waal interactions are much longer range. They're on the order of a nanometer or so, and uh, it's a competition between the Van der Waals and the atom atom interaction that actually gives you the the nature of the force between the tip and the substrate. Another big question was when, when, you, when you glue this, this uh, uh, diamond cantilever to a, can, or I'm sorry, when you glue the diamond tip to a cantilever, what size spring constant should the cantilever have, right? It wasn't clear in the early days how stiff to make the cantilever. Certainly you couldn't go buy the cantilevers, you had to make them, right? So I have memories of one of my grad students, Dave Schaefer, carefully gluing diamond shards onto small bristles of, from a paintbrush to try to make cantilevers, right? And we glue small mirrors onto the back of the, of the fiber to try to make a cantilever of known spring constant, right? It was, took a week to make a cantilever. And then the cantilever would break after a few scans. And so it was very, ine very inefficient. But how do you think about the type of spring constant that you need? And the way I like to motivate that is you, you have to use a spring constant in the cantilever that's comparable, roughly comparable to the spring constant that describes the motion of the atoms in a solid, right? And so from just simple mechanical, uh, physics where you've got two balls oscillating on a spring, you know, a spring connecting two balls. If the mass of the balls is on, a, is on the order of the mass of an atom, which is on the order of 10 to the minus 30 kilograms, and if you tell me the frequency that these two atoms vibrate, one with respect to another, well, that frequency is going to be close to a phonon frequency. Phonon frequencies are on the order of 10 to the 15 hertz, maybe 10 to the 14, depending on where you're at. Right? The spring constant then that connects these two atoms together is, is just omega squared times uh, the mass of the atoms, and that gives you a number that's on the order of a newton per meter. Right? So that simple logic tells you that you want a spring constant that 
uh, holds the tip above the substrate and the spring constant wants to be on the order of a newton per meter, right? So that was kind of the guidelines that we had in the real early days on how to make these cantilevers. We were trying to produce a, a small, flexible uh, piece of foil that roughly had a spring constant of about a newton per meter, and, and this is the justification for that. Right. Um, I like to say a little bit more about these atom-atom interactions, right? Because um, there are two types of of atom-atom interactions, right? If you imagine just taking two atoms and bringing them together, there are two possible binding mechanisms. One is a chemisorbed binding mechanism, and the other is a physisorbed binding mechanism. And the difference between these two quantities is significant. Right? The chemisorbed atom-atom interaction is much stronger than the physisorbed atom-atom interaction. Right? So the chemisorbed atom-atom inter interaction will actually lead to a chemical bond between the two atoms, or it could lead, it could lead to a chemical bond between the two atoms if the two atoms are properly uh, chosen, right? The equilibrium separation of that chemical bond is going to be on the order of 0.3 nanometers or less. So that means it's, you know, most chemical bonds are on the order of two to three angstroms, right? The bonding is very specific, right? Because two atoms won't bond unless their orbitals overlap properly, right? So it's a very specific uh, interaction. And uh, there's always an activation energy that is required to break that, that chemisorb bond, right? Uh, the physisorb situation is completely different. That's more like uh, just atoms settling down onto a substrate in a nonspecific way. The bonding of these atoms to the substrate is not specific. There's no chemical bond form. Usually you can desorb the fizzysorbed species by just heating the sample up to a temperature on the order of 100 degrees centigrade, right? So the bonding of fizzysorbed molecules to a substrate is much weaker. It tends to happen all the time. So anytime you have a piece of metal, any, anytime you have a, a piece of anything in, in air, you're going to get this fizzysorption. Molecules from the air will fizzysorb to the substrate in very quick, quick time frame, right? So you can imagine there's a layer of snow on your substrate that is a few, la few atom layers thick, right? It just happens. And what that snow is made from depends on the, the, the conditions of the air that you're doing the experiment in, okay? Uh, the fizzysorbed uh, equilibrium separations tend to be a little bit longer range than the chemisorbed because they're not, they're not, there's not a chemical bond between the fizzysorbed molecules and the substrate. It's just more of a, a weak association, right? So these are, these are sort of a, this, this atom atom picture kind of gives you some insight into the nature of the forces that exist between the tip tip in the substrate, right? And, and, and as you bring this tip closer to the substrate, in some sense you're probing some combination of these forces depending on the nature of your tip, depending on the chemical nature of the substrate. And of course, the remainder of the course, the middle part of the course is going to be discussing uh, how these atom-atom force laws determine the force that the tip exerts on the substrate, right? So that's a large part of AF, of quantitative AFM. If you quantitatively understand what, want to understand what's going on, you have to, you have to pay attention to these, uh, these force laws. So th th there'll be a lot more of this to come, right? Believe me. This is kind of just a brief introduction, right? Another important question is how close can this front atom come to the substrate? in the process of, let's say, bringing a tip and, and, and causing the tip to, to touch the substrate, 
what is the separation going to be between the front atom on the tip and the substrate atoms? And surface science answers that question very nicely because in surface science you can you can prepare a very clean substrate. You can put an atom on top of the substrate. And there's a variety of techniques that allow you to measure the atom spacing above the substrate. And I summarize some of those measurements here. This is a really nice uh, plot that I like to show. This shows a variety of different substrates, nickel, copper, molybdenum. So there's some silver in there, some titanium. And then they take various atoms and they deposit these atoms on top of these select substrates and they measure the bond length. They measure the distance, the separation between that, that red atom and the substrate atoms. And what you quickly learn from this picture is that that separation is on the order of 0.2 to 0.3 nanometers for a wide range of atoms on substrates. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna come back to this number over and over again. It it in it, when you when you read AFM literature, it's often referred to as A sub zero. It's like the minimum separation that you're gonna get between an atom and a substrate if you just drop the atom on the substrate. <coughs> Some of the lectures I give next week, I'm gonna talk about R star. Right, R star is gonna be characterizing the separation. Okay. And so it's good to have a, a sort of an idea of what that separation is, okay? Um, just again to, uh, to, to summarize a little bit, little bit more detail this nature of the tip substrate interactions. Um, and I've tried to characterize the different forces in terms of separation. Right, that's why this slide is possibly useful. All right, so when a tip is far from the substrate, there's no interaction between the tip and the substrate unless it's either an electrostatic or a magnetic interaction. So if the tip is magnetic and the substrate is magnetic, there'll be a long range magnetic interaction. If the tip is charged up and the substrate is electrically neutral, you can get an electrostatic interaction between the the tip and the substrate, right? As you bring the tip closer, right, and you get into this half nanometer range, right, this van der Waals interaction starts to take over. So the electrostatic and magnetic forces are long range. They're tens of nanometers, right? The van der Waals interactions, which are basically these nonspecific interactions that exist between all, all atoms, right? Uh, those kick in around a half a nanometer. Um, as you get closer, you can start to uh, form capillary forces, right? So this, this fizzy-sorb layer of molecules on the substrate can actually form a capillary and connect the tip to the substrate through a molecular bridge, right? This molecular bridge is, could be dominated by water, usually is, Right? So if you if you're doing a measurement on a humid day, right, you'll very easily form a water meniscus between the tip and the substrate. Right? That's what the capillary forces refer to. As you bring the tip closer to the substrate, if chemical bonding is possible, right? Then in principle you could get a chemical bond between atoms in the tip and atom in the substrate. When that chemical bond forms, you've got to have the tip 0.2 to 0.3 nanometers above the substrate. So that's, that's much, that's about a factor of two smaller than these van der Waals forces. The, sep and the van der Waals forces start to kick in around 0 0.5, 0 0.6 nanometers. The, the chemical uh, uh, bonding forces tend to kick in around 0 0.2, 0 0.3, right? There are frictional forces between the tip and the substrate. So that as you move the tip laterally over the substrate, any friction uh, between the tip and the substrate will dominate uh, um, the, the force on the tip. And then lastly, right, lastly, when the tip comes into very close uh, contact with the substrate, there's actually a deformation force. 
the tip will actually deform the substrate, and that'll be a, a big topic of conversation uh, in the remainder of this course. So this slide kind of sets up the next month's worth of lectures because virtually all these topics will be discussed in more detail, and it's only with the proper understanding of these forces that you start to really appreciate what an atomic force microscope is measuring. All right? There are, these things are always there. The casual user of an AFM refuses to acknowledge the existence of these forces, right? But they're always there, right? And a casual user of an AFM always gets an image. But the proper interpretation of those images, trying to get the most out of them, often requires some appreciation for these forces, right? So. The main reason you should be taking this course is to try to understand how these forces might influence the images that you obtain, right? And then you'll have, have a deeper understanding of, of how AFM works and how to avoid uh, misinterpreting. Um, images. Now, if you're going to do an AFM experiment, and if you're going to use the scanning probe technology, you have to eventually identify something that varies rapidly with position that will allow a feedback circuit to control against. Okay? So for STM, I tried to make the case that the tunnel current rapidly increases as the tip sample separation changes. And by building a feedback circuit to maintain a constant tunnel current, you can guarantee that the tip will be a certain distance above the substrate. So as you scan the substrate and there are bumps and wiggles underneath the tip, the tip uh, can adjust itself to maintain a constant tunnel current with enough precision that you can track these bumps and wiggles to fractions of an angstrom. Okay. The question becomes, what is the equivalent uh, parameter in an AFM experiment? What, what changes rapidly with position that you, you can control against, right? That, that's going to cause this cantilever to deflect in a controlled way, right? And the answer to that question is it's, it's usually, or at least in the early stages of AFM, the controlling parameter was the uh, interaction force, the repulsive interaction force that was felt by the tip as it was in contact with the cantilever. And I indicate that set point by this big red circle, right? You can see that the interaction force between the tip and the substrate varies quite steeply, changes quite steeply with position, and that's the quantity that you're going to control against in AFM. So you're going to take the same equipment that you use to build an STM, right? And you just have to make a few minor modifications, and if you understood how an STM works, then you can understand how an AFM works, because in AFM we're going to control on an interaction force in STM, we controlled off the tunnel current. So this diagram tries to summarize uh, in a in a in a, a fashion that's that's more numerical than the previous slide. Tries to summarize the different interaction forces as a function of separation. Right? You'll notice that the atom substrate. Set, so the atom is assumed to be the front atom on the tip. Right? There's always this assumption. That the at that, that a good tip always ends with one atom, right? Right. That atom substrate separation. There's no numbers given on that x-axis, right? This is just a schematic plot. But this van der Waals interaction starts to starts to kick in around a half nanometer. These chemical bonding interactions starts to set in around 0 0.2, 0 0.3 nanometers. This contact force develops when the tip, the leading atom on the tip is interacting with the atoms in the substrate, and they're separated by this 0 0.2, 0 0.3 nanometer bond distance, right? When that happens, you get a very strong repulsive force, right? And that repulsive force is then used as the control 
in a set in a in a feedback loop, and that allows you to do uh, atomic force microscopy. Okay, so one sign convention that we establish in this diagram that will come back over and over and over in the next month is that positive forces, right, forces above the above zero, positive, that's always representative of repulsive interactions between the tip and the substrate. And negative forces, forces below the axis, uh, right, that indicates an attractive regime. And so what this diagram is actually telling you is you bring the tip carefully to the, toward the substrate in a controlled way. Initially, the tip is actually attracted to the substrate. It goes through this this negative uh, region, right? There's actually an attraction of the tip toward the substrate. If you could let things t assume their equilibrium position, the tip would assume a position in which the force acting on the tip due to the substrate is zero, right? So maybe the equilibrium separation is indicated by that red, red line, red dot, which indicates where the force curve crosses through zero. That might be the equilibrium position of the tip above the substrate. That equilibrium position would be controlled by this parameter A0. Right? And then as you push in further, right, you actually start to deform the tip against the substrate. The cantilever that the tip is attached to now feels a repulsive force that rapidly shoots up. Okay, So you have to remember that sign convention because that's over and over again, that's what we're going to use in the remainder of the course, okay? How do you detect deflection? That was a big issue in the early days of AFM. So Binning's paper at Stanford uh, used this metallic needle and set up an STM tunnel junction between the back of the cantilever and the, uh, and the, uh, and the STM tip. Uh, that was very hard to achieve. Uh, to be honest, I only th think there was a few groups in the world that could make that work. Right? It was just it was just too hard. Uh, but very quickly, right? Within a few years, there were other techniques that were proposed. Um, I tried to um, highlight the original references, according to the way I read the literature, of these different techniques. And I like to just describe them briefly because it shows how clever people were in trying to implement a very accurate measurement of the cantilever deflection. So one technique was this optical fiber technique, and the optical fiber technique was uh, just place an optical fiber above the tip. You set up a little Fabre Perot cavity where light through the fiber is reflected from the end of the fiber and it's also reflected from the end of the tip. And since if you use a coherent light beam propagating through that optical fiber, you can set up interference patterns, right? And so by monitoring the intensity of the reflected light through the optical fiber, you can, you can get a handle on how the cantilever deflects, right? So this technique was also difficult to implement and then in the, in the early 1990s, late 1980s, early 1990s, you pretty much had to be an expert in optical fibers to make this work. We tried it, we never could make it work here at Purdue because we didn't have the technology to cleave the fibers. We didn't understand how to do that, right? If the, the, the end of the fiber has to be really flat in order to make this work. If you can't cut that fiber and make it really flat, uh, we found this this technique to be hard to implement. What's changed in the past, in the last 20 years, is now this optical fiber technology is sort of like plug and play, right? So you can you can actually go to companies and buy the fibers and buy the connectors, and you can screw everything together, and it, it's much easier to make work. But in the early days of AFM, this was very difficult, in my opinion. Um, Another, another idea was to use a position sensitive detector that's both based on a photodiode, right? So a photodiode is a, is a piece of electronics that if you put light into it, it produces a voltage out that's proportional to the intensity of light that goes in, 
And these position-sensitive uh, detectors, these position-sensitive photodiodes, uh, were, had already been designed for other purposes in the late 1980s, right? They were split. They were split photodiodes. So you actually had a photodiode in the top quadrant, top half of the detector, a separate photodiode in the bottom half of the detector. And the idea was simply if you put a laser beam and you position the laser beam so such the intensity in the top half of the photodiode was equal to the intensity in the bottom half of the photodiode, then in principle the voltage from the top half of the photodiode should be numerically equal to the voltage from the bottom half, right? And then what you can do is you can build a difference, uh, a subtraction circuit. It's very easy with operational amplifiers. So you can take these two voltages and you can subtract them in real time. And if the laser beam is precisely positioned so that the intensity in the upper half and the intensity in the lower half is identical, right? Then the photodiode output after you do the subtraction is zero. So it's a null detector, right? It's a null detector. You can crank the gain up very high because zero multiplied by any gain is still zero, right? And so the slightest amount of movement of that laser beam off that center position would cause a large voltage to appear on the output of the photodiode circuits, right? And so it's a very clever way to monitor position of the laser with respect to a, a arbitrary fiducial line, which is that center line in the photodiode. So that, that technology was introduced in 86 and 88. Um, Right, as a way to measure the deflection of the cantilever. Because as the cantilever deflects, if you have a laser beam bouncing off the end of the cantilever, right, and the laser deflects, then that reflected laser beam is going to raster up and down over that photodiode, and you're going to get voltages that are either positive or negative, depending on whether the laser beam goes above or below that center line. Right? Uh, there was also techniques involved to measure the capacitance of the cantilever, right? So the capacitance between two metal plates is inversely, to first approximation, it's inversely proportional to the separation between the plates. So if you can imagine the top plate of that capacitor is being fixed, the bottom plate of the capacitor is the backside of a cantilever. If you change the cantilever position with respect to the fixed top plate, right, there'll be a change in capacitance. And that change in capacitance can be measured and used to monitor deflection. And then uh, the piezo cantilevers were also introduced uh, in 93. Th this idea was very clever. It said, take a cantilever and deposit a material whose resistance changes as the cantilever is stressed. So when the cantilever bends, right, any, any thin film attached to it will also bend. In the process of bending, you're going to produce a, a strain field. And if the resistance of that piezo film, right, if that, that resistance changes with stress, then you've got a measure of cantilever bending, right? So this was a, this piezo resistive cantilever was kind of a, a, a real microfabrication problem, right? That was the electrical engineers just loved it because you had to go in a clean room and you had to deposit stuff and put leads on and, you know, fabricate. It was very complicated. Uh, but it actually got rid of any optical detection scheme. It, your detection scheme now just became electrical, right? Because you could measure, it's very easy to measure small changes in resistance. So there was about a half dozen different techniques uh, that, that were proposed to measure deflections of cantilevers. All the, all the suggestions were made in order to improve on that STM technique, which was really hard to implement. And of course, the one that's, that's won out today, uh, that virtually every AFM uses is this, um, is this beam deflection technique that, that's based on a photodiode, right? So very quickly, people moved from a segmented photodiode with just a bottom and an upper upper half and a bottom half, right? That was two segments, right? People quickly moved to a quadrented photodiode. So now you had four regions, A, B, C, and D uh, on this photodiode, 
Um, if you want to monitor the up and down motion of the cantilever, right, what you have to do is you have to position the laser spot so that it's halfway uh, uh, above the center line of this photodiode. And you have to add up the voltages from the A quadrant and B quadrant and subtract them from the uh, voltages generated by the C and D quadrants. Right? And if the photodiode, if the, if the, if the laser beam is deflected across the photodiode because the cantilever bends, right, then depending on which way the laser beam is, it moves across the photodiode, you either get a positive or a negative voltage. So I've tried to indicate in the bottom left of this image, right? This would measure the up-down motion of the cantilever. And what you're, what, you're, what you're doing is you're building electronic circuits that add up voltages from the top two quadrants. You're subtracting the voltages that are generated by the bottom two quadrants. If the laser beam is perfectly positioned, the difference between A and B and C and D should be zero, right? And then as the laser beam slightly moves, a little bit up or a little bit down, you're going to get a voltage. The polarity of the voltage is going to tell you which way the cantilever deflects. So it's perfect, right? The amount that the cantilever deflects is going to depend on the voltages. It's going to depend on the differences between A and B and C and D. So the bigger that difference is, the more the cantilever is deflected. And the polarity of the voltage that's generated tells you whether the cantilever moves up or down. So you got everything. It's great. Okay. The advantage of using the quadrented photodiode is that you can also measure a lateral force. So you can measure a twisting of the cantilever, right? If the cantilever rotates for whatever reason, right, then the laser beam will... <coughs> The laser beam will be deflected laterally across the photodiode. Now it becomes interesting to measure the voltages A plus C and the voltages B plus D. And differences in those voltages will then tell you which way the cantilever is deflecting. Right? The polarity of the voltage tells you the direction the cantilever uh, rotates. And the magnitude of the voltage tells you how much the cantilever rotates. Okay. So, this is the technique of choice. It's already 25 years old, right? So, in my opinion, newer generations of AFMs will go beyond this technology, right? This, this has been in place for 25 years, right? Just think of how many improvements there have been to PCs in the last 25 years, right? Every couple of years, there's another microprocessor chip that's introduced. Right? Yet, in AFM, we're stuck on the same technology that was proposed in the early 1990s. So that tells me, right, there's better ways to do it. There's new technology. That new technology just hasn't been merged into uh, measuring cantilever deflections. But eventually that'll happen, right? And you'll, you'll find, I predict, I predict five years from now when you all graduate and are professors at some other university and you're buying a new AFM to do your research, I predict that, that the new AFMs will not be using this quadrant photodiode approach. They'll have a better technology. Right. So we'll see if I'm right or wrong on that one. Right. Um, the question becomes how to maintain a constant force as this tip is rastered across the substrate. And the way to do it is exactly the same way as we did with an STM. Okay. Uh, um, basically, you have to take the voltage out of the photodiode and you have to compare it to a reference set voltage that you determine. You have, again, an operational amplifier circuit that compares those two voltages, the voltage from the photodiode and the, the set voltage. And the operation of that electronic circuit in this box is to move the substrate up or down in order to keep the voltage uh, out of the photodiode circuit constant. Because if you keep the voltage out of the photodiode circuit constant, that implies that the, f the, the force between the tip and the substrate is, is constant. 
And so you're, if you maintain a constant force as you raster that tip across the substrate, then any rise and fall in the Z position of the substrate, right, that can be directly attributed to topography. And in the early days, that's what everybody was interested in. They wanted to map out topography of substrates that were insulated. So, uh, to me, the, the big breakthrough uh, of jumping from STM to AFM was to realize that if you already had an STM working in your lab, you could take the same electronics and use it to control an AFM. So those of us that started an STM, we quickly realized we could do AFM by just duplicating our electronics. You had to change, I think, the sign of the feedback, uh, but that was a that was an easy thing to do, right? So in the early days, a lot of us doing STM started to do AFM because it was real simple. We have the same set of electronics, and one day we'd use it for STM, the next day we'd use it for AFM. So we'd have different students working on the same uh, with the same electronics on two different problems. Okay. So since the early days, uh, this AFM technology has really come a long way. And we'll, we'll come back to this towards the end of the semester. Um, this is a, an example of what uh, top quality AFM research is capable of doing. It's capable of actually identifying the chemical nature of, of different atoms on the substrate. So this, this paper is, is, uh, uh, was published in Nature back in 2007 and made the front cover because the scientists involved uh, were able to color in atoms on the surface depending on what the chemical uh, nature of those atoms were. So they were looking at this these tin and lead overlayers on silicon and they were able to map out which atoms were silicon, which atoms were tin, which atoms were lead. Right. So this is work that, that was led by Oscar Custance. Uh, he was working in uh, Japan at the time. And uh, this is like 20 years after the invention of the AFM. This is the level that it's reached. Right. But this is clearly world class, right? Not everybody can do that. The other thing that's interesting is to look back in time and realize that no matter what you think about, somebody's probably already thought about it before you, <laughs> right? And this AFM technology is no, no exception. Turns out if you read the literature carefully, you can find back in 1929 a, a paper by Schmalz where uh, this is a diagram out of his paper, right? And it's pretty much the same technology as AFM usage is today. It's a, it's a little bit different. He didn't have a photodiode to measure the reflected light from the cantilever. He had a photographic plate, uh, but he had a light source. Light source reflected a, uh, a beam of light off of a mirror that was attached to the cantilever. There was a moving stage, right? So the stage was rastered underneath a sharp tip Right, and as the laser beam deflected across the, the photographic film, by just doing simple geometry, he was able to work out how much the tip had to go up and down in order to produce the measured deflection of the light beam. Right, So his microscope uh, could generate profiles, height profiles, uh, with a magnification uh, slightly greater than, than a thousand. Right. So the technology he used in 29, which is very similar to the AFM technology, uh, makes use of the large optical uh, lever that, that exists between the mirror and the, and the detector right? it, that magnifies very small motions of the tip, allows you to measure it with high accuracy. Okay, so that's, that's a little bit of history. Uh, it's probably useful to uh, just document the way I read the literature. Uh, it sort of provides the 
timeline for some of the big advances in, in AFM technology, or in scanning probe technology, right? So it started in 1981 with the scanning tummy microscope, then the first AFM came along in 1986. 1987, people were doing non-contact scanning, so they had, they had gotten away from actually touching the tip to the substrate in a contact mode. They started to oscillate the tip right away in 1987. Uh, right, This optical beam bounce technique uh, came along in 89. Uh, right, The computer control of, of STMs and, A and AFMs, that, that was reported in 88. That, that was a big step. Uh, the first microfabricated tips was 1991. So from 1986 to 1991, you were making tips and cantilevers uh, on the lab bench, right? And it was very painful. And then lastly, uh, 93, this intermittent contact mode was introduced where the tip uh, intermittently contacts the substrate. And that's, that's a technique which if you've done any AFM work yourself, you probably recognize, right? So <clears throat> that's uh, like a, a brief summary of the early um, early events, just for historical purposes. As you're probably well aware, there are uh, as many different scanning probe techniques as there are students in the university, right? Everyone that does an AFM that does an AFM experiment, somehow invents a new AFM technique. And at one point in time, uh, right, it was hard to know what to call scanning probe microscopy, right? It was either STM or AFM, but very quickly, STM had a variety of different techniques, AFM had a variety of different techniques. So there, for a few years, there was actually a suggestion that we call this scanning probe technique, something called SXM, where X is a variable and you plug in whatever acronym you want in the middle because the first letter S is for scanning, the last letter M is for microscope, and X is a variable that you, you, you choose yourself, right? So um, just to give you an idea of the wide variety of different techniques that were invented, uh, this is a nice summary I got, I got from uh, uh, a book by Ten Walde, 1998. So this, these acronyms are already probably out of date, uh, but it just just shows you how rapidly this scanning probe microscope technique spread throughout the scientific and engineering disciplines. Right? It it, it was a it was an invention at the right place, at the right time, everybody needed it. It was rapidly uh, implemented in all labs throughout the world, right? And it was really inexpensive. For under $10,000, you could build an STM or an AFM back in the early days. And so everybody that wanted to get into this business built their own equipment. And that was one of the real reasons why this, this branch of, of science that we call nanotechnology took off. It was all of a sudden, everyone in the world could start to look at nanoscale features on surfaces, right? So, wide variety of names. This SXM thing didn't stick around very long. Now everybody just refers to it as scanning probe microscopes. And, and I think that's what you'll find uh, uh, in most of the literature today. So. To summarize and to end up, right, these first few lectures, what I've tried to do is I've tried to show you that a scanning telling microscope is basically an electrical measurement that relies on this quantum mechanical tunneling of electron states through a, through a barrier of finite width. Uh, conversely, the AFM measurement technique relies on the atomic force between a tip and a substrate, right? So it's more of a mechanical measurement. And um, if you come back next week, we'll talk a lot more about the nature of this interaction force law. Right? We'll discuss the origins of that in some detail. And then we'll turn the 
uh, floor over to my esteemed college, colleague in mechanical engineering who will tell you everything you ever wanted to know about how cantilevers vibrate, okay, and how they move. So uh, I think that's that, that ends today's lecture. Be happy to answer questions. But next week, we'll have a couple lectures on the shape of that, that uh, interaction force and where it comes from, uh, from at a microscopic level. All right, we'll discuss the origins of that. Okay, great.